Well, if you're ready to get into the Word this morning, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready too. You know, I want to start off by sharing with you my goal as your pastor. And, and it, my goal is to inspire you to equip the church to remain fully engaged in our, in our mission here at Joy. And so you might be asking, well, what is your mission? What is the mission? You hear it a lot around here, but if you're new, we'll, uh, we'll share this with you. Our mission here at Joy, it's really quite simple, and it's to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Did, we get, did that update for you? It did not update. Okay. All right. Any other techies in the house? Okay. And so... Someone say, we're going to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. That is our mission here at Joy. That's why we exist. And so everything that we do, everything that we say as a church should and will revolve around and line up with the mission. And if it doesn't, we know that we can cut it out. We know it, it, it doesn't belong. It's, it's taking us, it's steering us in the wrong direction. And so when you leave this place, when you, when you go out into the mission field, that you would be inspired to lead other people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. It doesn't stop here. This is just the beginning. You're learning and you're being equipped within these four walls on how to take this gospel, this good news, to the mission field. I didn't hear an amen. I heard maybe a little amen. two amens. Yeah. <laughs> because I truly believe that, that our faith, it doesn't come into its fullness here on earth until our faith, the faith that we have, begins to spill out of our lives. It begins to touch, affect, and influence the lives of those around us who aren't yet saved. Think about that. Because the gospel, it's good news. It will always be good news. It will never be fake news. It will never be old news. It'll never be something that gets, um, will ever fade. And if this is truly good news and if it's truly affected your life, I can't help but to assume that it's gonna spill out of your life and begin to touch, affect, and influence the people around you. You a little slow this morning? Can I hear an amen? Just a little amen? Romans, the first chapter, the 16th verse, Paul says it like this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the what? Gospel. Not ashamed of the gospel. Remember, the gospel is the good news of a savior. The good news of Jesus Christ. The good news of, of the Messiah who would come, who would put us in right standing with God because of his sacrifice that he made. And so Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because I know what it is. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Paul is saying, not just me, bro. Not just you, but everyone who believes. And he takes it a step further and he says, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Basically what he's saying is for everyone. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter of the, the age demographic. It doesn't matter the background that you came out of or the, the background that you're living in right now. This good news is for everybody. And just, Paul is saying, just as it's changed my life, it is power unto salvation to everybody. And so Paul was at a place where he understood that the gospel, it wasn't meant to just change his life, but because of the way that it changed his life, it would also touch, affect, and influence the life's the lives of others to be changed too. Amen. Thank you. And so my prayer as your pastor is that you would, you would come not just to, to consume, but that you would take it even a step further and that you would begin to contribute. Not to me, but to the kingdom of God Amen. and to share the good news of the gospel that has already changed your life. And if it hasn't yet, I know you stick around long enough, it's gonna change you from the inside out. That you would personally take the time to talk with God and ask him, in what way, God, do you want me to contribute to your mission? 
In what way, God, do you want me to take what I've consumed and use it to contribute to your kingdom? Because what happens to someone who just consumes and consumes and consumes and consumes, they get fat. We don't want to be a bunch of um, spiritually fat Christians. But we want to take what God has given to us and what we've consumed and take it and use it. Burn those spiritual calories. That's not in the notes. Just... I just feel it this morning. I feel like, like we're ready. We're right. We're not waiting for a move of the, of the Spirit. That happened in the book of Acts. It happened on the day of Pentecost. He's waiting for us to make ourselves available so he can begin to move in us and through us. Just imagine if everyone in this room caught the wave of the Holy Spirit. Not just one of us, but all of us would take what we've learned, the gospel message that has changed our lives and we take it to the world. Not the world, your world. You, 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 there's a world that revolves around you. Everywhere you go, you have people that you know, people that you run into on a regular basis. That's, that's your world. In fact, why don't you pray this prayer with me? Would you say, Heavenly Father, I know that I'm not here by accident, but I know that you're speaking to my heart. Help me to know your will for your kingdom and your purpose for my life. Give me the strength not to just consume, but to contribute, to be a part of your mission, bringing glory and honor to the name that is above all names, your son, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Put your hands together for Jesus this morning. Can I be excited this morning? Is it okay with you? I want to welcome you to uh, part three of our series that I'm calling I Am. Can I hear someone say I Am? I Am. And so God is doing, I believe that God is doing a great work here at Joy. And I want to thank those of you who are, who are being open and receptive to the spirit of God. God is looking to do great and mighty things in and through the lives of that have been made available to him, not just the pastor, but anyone and everyone who will make themselves available to God, to the Holy Spirit. You see, God's not out looking around and searching for perfect people because if you didn't realize it yet, those don't exist, but he's looking to do extraordinary things in and through ordinary people. You find this all throughout the word of God. And in week one, we we were with Moses as God spoke to him through a burning bush, telling Moses that, that Moses, you're gonna be the one that I'm gonna use to free the nation of Israel from hundreds of years of slavery. And then Moses asked God in that third chapter of Exodus, in that 13th verse, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? God, what am I gonna tell him? What do I tell them is your name? And God said to Moses, I'm glad you asked. He says, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. Can I hear someone say, I am. am. And so last week in part two, wasn't that good? You've been seeing some, some clips running around here and there on social media Uh, But last week in part two, we see Jesus, he's in this confrontation with the Pharisees. These are the religious leaders of that time. And we see in John 8, 58, Jesus says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And so Jesus, we see Jesus take ownership of that title, I am, proclaiming to the Jews that he was the one who was calling out to Moses from that burning bush. And so what we must realize, church, is that that God is the only one who can accurately describe himself as I am. And in John 8, 58, Jesus claimed that title for himself, saying that before Abraham was, I am. And because he made that claim, the Pharisees, they got upset, they got got all huffy and puffy because they knew what that claim meant. That that meant that Jesus was claiming ownership of the title God. I am. Self-sufficient, self-existent. And so what did they do? They, they begin to gather up stones 
to throw at him, to throw at Jesus. But then when they went to throw him at Jesus, he wasn't there. There are some different uh, variations of different things that people think happened during that time. I won't, won't share them here. Of how Jesus escaped and it's fun to think of those things sometimes. Uh, but in the book of John, I don't know if you knew this, but Jesus uses uh, this I am declara uh, declaration on seven different occasions. Let me say that again. Jesus, he uses this I am declaration on seven different occasions, followed by or followed with metaphors that would further express his saving relationship toward the world. And I want to, I want to show that to you this morning. We could actually take each one and take a, um, do a whole sermon, probably a whole sermon series on each uh, claim that he made. But we're going to give a, I'm going to give you a crash course this morning. We're going to go through all seven of them. And it starts off in John, the sixth chapter in the 25th verse. If you have your Bible, you can turn there with, with us. Are you with me? Yeah? Okay, cool. Right on. Woo! Excited. Okay, John, the sixth chapter. And that 25th verse, if you've got it, say, I've got it. Got it. This is the first time Jesus makes the claim, I am. He says, I can do nothing on my own. Actually, where am I starting? 25. Get on the right page, guys. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you, when did you come here? When did you get here? Because Jesus had just fed the, the 5,000 plus and Jesus, he was, he was hiding. He was getting away. He was tired. He was physically tired. And so he sent his disciples along as he was finishing up with, with feeding the, the, the thousands. And then he gets away on his own and, and he ends up uh, seeing the, the disciples in the storm he knew it was going to happen already. He was there and they had their little moment there. And then, so he, Jesus is walking on water. And, and then after that, they get to the other side. And when they get there, the people were following Jesus. They said, hey, when did you get over here? We've been looking for you, Jesus. <laughs> and so Jesus, he answered them. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs. And, and I, I appreciate how John, he describes the miracles that Jesus performed because the, the, um, John understood that the, the miracles that Jesus performed weren't random acts of kindness. These weren't random acts of um, shooting from the hip, like, oh, you need to be healed. No, everything that Jesus did was intentional. He didn't accidentally run into someone that needed healing. He knew they were going to be there. He had a divine appointment with them, even though they didn't know he was going to be there. But he was showing up for them, just like he has in our lives. He showed up on that one day. <laughs> and we're here now. We're still alive and kicking. And so John, he shows us that these miracles were actually signs pointing to who he was, who had sent him, and what his mission was. And so he says, not because, he says, Jesus is saying, you're not seeking me, you're not following me and, and, and seeking me out because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. And he says, don't, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that, he, that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal or his, his approval. He says, stop being so concerned about things that will only last temporary. Dude, my kids will eat and like an hour later, they're hungry. And these people were following Jesus, like feed me, give me more, see more. Like, you know, like they were, they were wanting Jesus to keep feeding them. Yeah, you can keep, and keep while you're at it, keep telling us those, those stories that you were telling. And man, they're just, they're like pulling up recliners and, and kicking up their feet. And then the food too, Jesus, and the food. I brought my TV tray. And we can become so guilty of that because we're searching for things that only temporarily suffice. They temporarily satisfy. And we're looking at that thing and maybe we've, we've put that, that weight on a person's shoulders. We begin to get, get upset at that person because they can't possibly carry that weight. We begin to get angry with them. We get upset with them. Jesus is saying, stop, stop searching for the food that's only going to perish. 
What does he say? Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that, he, that endures to eternal life. Stop scrambling around, hurting yourself, putting the weight of the world on these things that, that weren't meant to carry, carry the weight that you're putting on them. He says, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him, God the Father has set his seal or his seal of approval. Then they said to him, well, what must we do to belong or to, um, to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God. He spells it out plain and simple, that you believe in him whom he has sent. There it is. Jesus did all the hard work. Son of man has done all the hard work. Now you believe on him. And so they said to him, then, then well, well, why is it we always want more? We always want, well, there's got to be more, right? So then, then what do we, what sign are you going to do, Jesus, that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? They just got fed. From five loaves and two fish. And what he was doing, he was actually pointing to what he would be saying in this moment. That he is, well, let me not spoil it here. And then they said, well, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it wasn't Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. But my father gives you the true bread from heaven. You see, that only lasted for a day. Give us this day our daily bread. Because after the day, the next day, the bread, if they accumulated it for more than one day, it would spoil showing us a picture of who Jesus would be, who the Savior would be. That it's not a one and done kind of a thing where Jesus would come and he would give us our daily bread. He would be our daily bread. He says in that 33rd verse, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Kind of making reference back in John three sixteen, of what he already said. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. It's the first, it's the first I am declaration that Jesus makes. And he follows it up with, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And someone who has, would have their physical ears listening to this, they would say, well, that's not possible. They haven't even made gum that has everlasting flavor yet. How are they gonna make food that makes you so you're not ever hungry? And so Jesus, he says, I am the bread of life. And it's funny how the people who saw the signs that he had performed they were, they were pointing to who he was, the one who sent him, and the prophecies that he was fulfilling. And it's funny how they still didn't believe. You know how I know they didn't believe? In that next verse, but Jesus' Jesus' words, he says, but I say to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. And so Jesus, he says, I am the bread of life. He was the fulfillment of that manna or that bread that God had sent from heaven to feed the nation of Israel in the wilderness. You see, the bread in the wilderness was a sign that was pointing to the one who would eventually come not to feed the desires of the external, not to feed the desires of the flesh, but who would come to feed the hunger and the longing for the internal and the eternal or the spiritual. And so even a, a, lot, of, a lot of Jesus followers are, are, had this unrealist, unrealistic expectation of who God is and what following Jesus means. If you talk to Jesus about what it is, it's not about getting stuff. It's about carrying your cross. Ouch. But that doesn't sell in, in 2019, right? It's not a good marketing scheme. Oh yeah, come, come follow, follow Jesus and carry your cross. Jesus came for something deeper, 
something on the inside, something that is eternal. And if there's one thing that is true about all humans, it's that we're all hungry for something. We're all searching for something to appease our cravings, to satisfy our desires. But there's only one who is able to completely satisfy, and that is the bread of life. And his name is Jesus Christ. I'm gonna move on over to eight, the eighth chapter in the 12th verse. And it said, Jesus says there, I am the light of the world. So he goes from the bread of life. Now he is claiming to be the light of the world. I am the light of the world. He says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And one thing I've learned about light is that when light stands next to darkness, light always wins. Always. 100% of the time. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Another thing about light is that when, when the light shines, it, ex it exposes all those things that are hiding under the cover of darkness. I don't know if you've ever been in a room where there's cockroaches and you flip the light on and they just scatter. You shine the light on, they've, they've got to go. Or if you've seen a crime in progress, many times what will happen, a lot of times it happens in, in the middle of the night. Under the cover of darkness. And when they're in the middle of the crime, the criminal committing a crime, and the light goes on, many times what they will do is they'll run. <laughs> I've been spotted, I've been seen. And at the beginning of the eighth chapter of John, the religious leaders, they bring a woman who was just caught in the act of adultery. How awkward would that be? And they, they bring her to Jesus and they ask Jesus, what do you think we should do with this woman? And they're trying to trap Jesus. They're trying to, to trick him, trying to back him into a corner, trying to cause Jesus to say something wrong, something that's against the law or something that's against his mission or trying to, trying to cause him to trip up somehow, some way. And so they bring this, this woman before Jesus. Hey, Jesus, what do you think we should do with this woman? We know what the law says, but, but Jesus, we want to hear what you have to say about it. And Jesus, he responds with, how about this? The one among you who has no sin. How about you cast the first stone? As Jesus, the light of the world, exposes the sin of those religious leaders, showing to that woman and showing to everyone who was around that they were no greater than this woman. As the light of the world, expose the sin of those religious leaders. You know, the part of the earth that is facing the sun is exposed to its light. But the part that is turned away from the sun is in complete darkness. And what the sun is to the earth, Jesus Christ is to the human heart. And so when we turn away from ourselves and we turn to Jesus, not only does he expose what's been hiding in the darkness, exposing our broken condition, exposing our desperate need of a savior, but he illuminates our path, giving us a clear and open pathway to what it looks like to be in right standing with God. This is what Jesus does as the light of the world. Which leads us to number three. So the first one was, I am the bread of life. Second one, I am the light of the world. And the third one here is found in John, the 10th chapter, starting with that seventh verse. So Jesus again said to them, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. 
And Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So Jesus says, I am the door. What's so significant about a door? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. So hopefully, hopefully when you walked in through the doors of the church this morning, you were greeted with a smile. And um, hopefully someone opened the door for you. When you get home today, you're probably gonna open a door and you're gonna walk through into your home. Every building that I've ever been in has had an entrance somewhere. And for the kingdom of God, it also has an entrance and his name is Jesus Christ. You know, you, you, you may have been in a building that has many doors, but God has set up his kingdom so that it would only have one door. And the only door that leads to heaven, the only door that leads to God, the only door that opens and swings wide open to eternal life is found in the only begotten son of God. Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the door. And then a couple verses later, he's kind of like rapid fire here. In verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Not just a shepherd, but the good shepherd. Not a good shepherd, but the good shepherd. And so how could Jesus claim to be the door and the shepherd for the sheepfold all at the same time? You see, the sheepfold didn't typically have a door. And so what the shepherd would do is that he would lay across the doorway, making sure to protect his sheep. So when he was sleeping at night, he wouldn't sleep with the sheep, but he would sleep across the doorway. So not only was he the shepherd, but he was also the door. So that if any thieves or any robbers came in to steal his sheep or maybe wolves would come or wild animals came in to eat his sheep, he would be on guard and he'd be ready to protect them. He would be their first line of defense. Jesus said, a good shepherd is one who lays down his life for the sheep. John, the first chapter, the 29th verse, we see the words of John the Baptist. And he sees Jesus approaching him and the group that he was with as he was baptizing. And as Jesus is approaching, he says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, which shows us that Jesus came down from off of his throne in heaven to identify with us who are the sheep. But he is also the good shepherd. You see, the fact that Jesus became a lamb emphasizes the humanity of Christ. The fact that he is the good shepherd emphasizes the deity of Christ. You see, Jesus alone is worthy and able to save us. No other human being could do this, which means that Jesus had to be God. Can I hear someone say, I am? Amen. Number five, we find this in John chapter 11, starting with that 24th verse. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. In this case, in this situation, Jesus was talking to Martha. Martha was the sister of Lazarus who had been dead for four days. Jesus got there four days too late. Lazarus, he was buried. He was in the tomb. It was already covered. And so Jesus, he looks at Martha and he says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he's physically dead, will continue to spiritually live. And you know, some, some will interpret the 26th verse to mean that for those Jesus followers who believe, 
that are still alive when Jesus returns will never die. They'll be caught up in what we call the rapture or the second coming of Christ. And so to prove to Martha and to all those who were there mourning the loss of Lazarus, Jesus physically brings Lazarus back to life. He brings him back from the dead. And it was a sign that was pointing to who he was. He was the resurrection and the life. Someone say, I am. am. You see, life begins at the moment a person accepts the Savior. Because whoever lives and believes in Jesus will never die. This is what Jesus said. He was the resurrection and the life because Jesus had already died for them and the penalty for their sin has already been paid for and they will never be separated from God. And so just as Jesus, as he raised Lazarus from physical death, it was a sign showing us today in 2019 what Jesus is able to do for us spiritually. Through Jesus... We are new creatures. We're born again through the spirit of God. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Let's move on to number six, John the 14th chapter. Starting with that first verse. It says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to to where I am going. And man, like, sometimes when Jesus talks, I'm sure like, I do this all the time, and I got caught when I was in Little League by my coach, where they'll be talking to me, and I'm, I'm in like Hawaii, and I'm just shaking my head. And I could just imagine sometimes what Jesus, the things that Jesus would say would go over their head because he was speaking spiritual and they were thinking physical. And, and, I could, and so Thomas, thank God for Thomas. You know, we call, we call him, well, I, like, I didn't make this up. This was made up for us, but we call Thomas, doubting Thomas, right? And so thank God for Thomas for, for speaking up. Sometimes I'm thankful for the person who speaks up in the group because I had the same question. And so Thomas is like looking around, like looking at the disciples are all like their, their eyebrows are like all going into contortions. Like, Gee, what is Jesus talking about? And then Thomas is like, Jesus, can I ask you a question? What is it, Thomas? And Thomas, he speaks up and says, Lord, I don't think I'm speaking for myself, but I think I, I'm speaking for all of us when I say, we don't know where you're going. How could we possibly know the way? And so Jesus, he says to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I love what Jesus says, how he follows this up. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. He says, if you you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And I love this. I love, 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 love this. Because he doesn't, condemn Thomas he doesn't like you make him an example like pull his ear up and like take him to the office like you're wrong Tom no he look what he says he gives him a word of encouragement he says from now on you do know him and you have seen him because you know me Thomas and you 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 know the father because you've known me and you you've seen me many times we want to make examples of people instead of giving them the answer. Paul says in Acts the fourth chapter, the 12th verse, he says, and there is salvation in no one else. Don't get it twisted, don't get it confused. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I'm pretty sure if we all put our minds together, we started brainstorming of of the different names that we have used the different things, the different substances, the different places, the different, uh, different people that we've, we've tried to use to be our salvation. But Paul shows us 
There is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven. There's no name above the name of Jesus. Jesus wasn't just a good teacher. Yes, he was. But he was also the bread of life. Who else can say that? He was the light of the world. Who else can say that? I can't. So Jesus, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way into the presence of God than by accepting the death of Jesus, our Lord, as payment in full for our sins. And notice how Jesus, he didn't say, I, I, you know, I'm one of the options. Uh, you know, there's, there's a bunch of different ways, but if you choose me, it's kind of better. You know, I got, I got perks. But he's very emphatic when he says who he is. He says, I am the, the way. <laughs> I am the truth. I am the life. There's only one way to God the Father, and that's through God the Son. Number seven. Getting a crash course this morning. John, the 15th chapter, the fifth verse. He says, I am the vine. He follows that up by saying, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so when Jesus, when he says these words, it, it was coming down to the wire. It was coming down um, to the, his last words, his last moments before he would give his life on a cross for all of humanity. And he was saying to his disciples, you're gonna see some things. You're gonna hear some things. You're going to experience some things, but don't allow any of these things to distract you from being those branches that are attached to the vine, those branches that are attached to me. Because as long as you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. You see, it's important for us to understand that salvation is not a fruit-bearing event. So in this statement, Jesus was talking about our life after we're saved. When a person receives Christ, he gives you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit produces fruit in your life. What kind of fruit, you might ask? Plums, maybe What's your favorite, mango? Mango's good. No, none of that stuff. It starts off with love. He gives you a supernatural power to love even when people don't love you back. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Joy is another fruit. Through the Holy Spirit, we can have joy even through the storm, even through all kinds of problems and suffering. There's also peace. When we're attached to the vine, when we're attached to Jesus, we can have peace in our heart. Where once there was confusion, where once there was turmoil, where once there, was, there were doubts, questions and just it was chaotic but when you come to Jesus and you attach yourself to the vine the Holy Spirit comes in and one of the fruits that he produces within your life is peace he'll give you peace then there's patience there's gentleness goodness faithfulness and self-control so for a person who doesn't yet believe, hear, hear me now, we're landing the plane. For a person who doesn't yet believe, they cannot bear this fruit. And even after a person is saved, believers aren't automatically fruitful. This is key, church, this is key, listen up. But as we attach ourselves to the vine, as we yield our life to Jesus, when we respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, that is when we bear much fruit. 
And so we see here that Jesus is the bread of life. He's the light of the world. He's the door. He's the good shepherd. He's the resurrection and the life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the vine. Jesus is, I am that I am. And that's all you need to know. Would you pray with me this morning? Your name, your name.